Okay, the first reading comes from Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, and chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. And then on to chapter 12. Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of joy, okay, that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. <laughs> For our gospel today, we're taking two sections of a narrative that Jesus has when he's commissioning his disciples to go out. It's Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 to 31 and 34 to 39. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who cannot, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Parenthesis here. This is God, but God's a God of love. A little narrative in between. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are all counted. So. Do not be afraid. You are more value than many sparrows. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of our Lord. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Interesting gospel for Father's Day. Family members set one against the other. And I have a question, which is the sermon title for today. Which is it? Sword or peace? Which is it that Jesus came? We know that he is the Prince of Peace. He announced peace the evening of the resurrection. Peace be with you. And yet here there's a different kind of a message, a sword. We know that Jesus said after Peter cut off the ear of Malchus that those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. But to get a perspective on this, I'd like to invite you to Come with me 
to Antakaya. Antakaya, let me just put the map up here. Antakaya is a little slow on the uptake here, but we'll get it. Do you see in this map, here is Turkey. Can you follow me with my, with my, uh, with my arrow? This is part of Turkey. Interesting that Turkey is an intercontinental country. Part of it's in Asia Minor. Part of it is in the mainland on the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Antakya is the modern name for Antioch. You'll remember in the book of Acts, that's where they were first called Christians, in Antioch. So there was a church in the community that scholars think this is sort of where St. Matthew's community was. Now, this is the Matthew that's a disciple, apostle of Jesus. But the gospel, they say, was written around 80 or 90 AD, a little bit after the time of Jesus and his contemporaneous people. So 90, 80 or 90 would mean that those who are contemporaneous of Jesus and the apostles, this is now the third generation. These are the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of the generation when Jesus lived. So it was an interesting community. It's a community that was suffering a lot because in the early stages of the expression of Jesus. They didn't have the idea of starting a separate religion. They wanted to get all of Judaism and this new faith in Jesus together into one place. But a lot of the Jewish people up there didn't like the idea. So when Jesus was saying, what you hear at night, probably supposes that they would gather at night to share their memories of Jesus share these recent nascent scriptures of Jesus in such a way that they were supporting and protecting each other. But then Jesus says, don't be afraid. Now remember that the words of Jesus are filtered through three generations and always all of the gospels look at Jesus from the point of view of the resurrection. So we don't have to time lapse and pretend that the words of Jesus that we got from the gospel written in Greek are the actual words of Jesus. We probably have some recollections of that because the oral tradition that carried on in Aramaic into Northern Syria, there are places in Syria where Aramaic is still spoken. It's beginning to fade out. And people are concerned that they might be able, they might be losing the language that Jesus spoke. So the stories of Jesus, the power of his resurrection started to flow out into all these different kind of communities, one of which was Antioch and likely the place where Matthew's congregation was. Think of Matthew as like St. Matthew's United Methodist Church in Newark. There's a St. Luke's Church. There's a St. John's Church. So that these are under the patronage and the inspiration. Who knows how the oral tradition of Matthew, the tax collector, and his powerful thing started to unfold. And so they connected to his words in such a way that this is Matthew's gospel. So they were persecuted in some way. Not exactly the persecution like in the Roman times, but when Jesus in the narrative talks about don't be afraid of those that can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Respect the one who is Lord of life. Don't be afraid of them. In, those, in that area, uh, it wasn't until later that the real persecutions where crosses were, 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 were strung up for people. But this is reading back. So Jesus in his imagined narrative at the beginning is talking about the cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't be afraid of the cross. Don't be afraid of your suffering. Let it begin to unfold as something powerful and new. Here's a, a little backup look of, uh, in the map. You see here Jerusalem and Israel down here. Here's Lebanon and here's, look at Aleppo over here. You know Aleppo? That's the place where they gassed children, where there was a great uh, persecution of those that wanted to rebel. Not too far away 
is it from Hantakaya where that star is? Let me just come back so that I can look at you and you can look at me. Let me just go. Sorry for this little pause. I just have to find. So the nighttime meetings, and don't be afraid of those. If there's something that's happening in all of the commotion, wouldn't Jesus be saying, don't be afraid? I'd like to share with you a story about fear because a lot of what's going on in our world today is based on fear. Fear of the other, fear of what I don't know, fear of the other. So there's a, a parable about uh, this group of people that found a watermelon growing in their field and they didn't know what it was. They thought it was a monster. So somebody walks into the field, recognizes it, that it's a watermelon, and to show them that there's nothing to be afraid of, he picks up the watermelon and eats it in their presence. Well, they became even more afraid. They because he thought he might do that to them. Scene changes. Someone else comes in, recognizes that it's a watermelon, but recognizes the people's fear. And he goes, shh, we must be very careful. So they tiptoe out of the watermelon and slowly, he teaches them how to cultivate watermelons. Is that not what we need to be respectful? Way down inside in people's souls, there are fears. Yeah, there's prejudices, and yeah, there's all kinds of outbreaks, all kinds of stuff. Inside, there's fear. If we can approach each other, looking and respecting the fear, and slowly to teach them about love. Now, what about that sword? Uh, what's interesting, in Micah chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus is almost quoting this. For the son treats the father with contempt, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, your enemies are members of your own household. Jesus really goes back into that prophetic, wonderful prophet of Micah and quotes him. So what happens in our household, and there are people that are interiorly divided one thing or another. What happens is, this is a description. How do we get through to peace? I'd like to suggest, and Jesus said, those that live by the sword perish by the sword. It's a different kind of a sword. Dave read about it. The word of God is living and active. Just that the words in your Bible book, whatever the translation, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you had to have an operation, would there not be a kind of sword used called a scalpel? There's a comedian we were listening to it said, you know, with all these video uh, conferences with doctors, what do you do when there's a surgeon? Uh, excuse me, go to your go to your kitchen and get the really sharp, sharp knife and follow my instructions. And then the internet breaks apart. <laughs> Joke. So the sword of the spirit is slices into us gently, separates our fears from our anxieties, our thoughts and our concerns, our angers, our frustrations, our sorrows, pierces at until we get to this place, which was the second part of David's, David's reading. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy and suffering. 
I'd like to share with you a powerful quote from Imana Perry. So I must turn the pitying gaze back upon, <clears throat> now unfortunately I've got to get my, here we are, okay. I must turn, I must turn the pitying gaze back upon any who offer it to me because they cannot understand the spiritual majesty of joy in suffering. What a phrase. Remember that phrase, the spiritual majesty of joy in suffering. But my rejection of their account also comes with an invitation. If you join us, you might feel not only our pain, but also the beauty of being human. It's a powerful, powerful quote. It's a powerful, powerful message during this time when there is so much negative things, if we can touch the place inside us where there is joy, if we touch that place, it's also the place of peace, peace in the midst of suffering. As I begin to wind this sermon down, and it's, it is so one, there's something about preaching in this way that's very exciting for me, because as I look into the camera, in my heart, I'm seeing each of you, seeing the people who later will see this on the recording. As I look into the camera, I'm looking directly into, I love preaching in a congregation. I love that. Uh, I love catching the eye contact when I can. But here it's as though I got all your eye contact and you all have my contact. So there's a power and something very special about this. There are limitations, hard to sing together, little time lapses here and there but we can be together in this marvelous, marvelous way. I'm gonna close with another story uh, that comes from the tradition of that same area, Syria. Uh, it has its roots in other uh, dimensions, Muslim dimensions and so on. But you know something at the heart of it all, it's all the same, it's all the same people are trying, if their heart is open to it, to find the living God who is resting in the bottom of their soul. Remember in Matthew 25 when he said, when I was hungry and poor, how did I know? I didn't know that I was serving you. And you did it to the least of mine. You did it to me. So that's an important thing. And it's so important for us in this world where we're tended to judge uh, salvation. I remember one time I shared this story a couple of times. When I was in Vineland, there was a, a radio programmist that would interview people. And he always kind of had a trick question at the end. So I was kind of wondering what my trick question is going to be. So he said, hey, Pastor Nick, before you go, somebody dies and they haven't accepted Jesus. Will they get to heaven? So I said to him, not my call. And it was silence after that. And then the program came to an end. So it's good for us to want to share the love of God inside us. Just do it. Cut through all of the stuff that's in the way from you loving. That's where the double-edged sword comes in. It wiggles its way down into the bottom and just extracts the presence of God inside you. So here's a, a really delightful story. Uh, a master was out one day for a trip with his disciples. He was riding on a donkey and they were walking. All of a sudden, the donkey came out with a very loud noise as the donkey passed gas. Suddenly, the master broke down and began to sob and sob. Oh, master, said one of his disciples. What's the trouble? Can we help? I was just riding along, he said, thinking about how good life is. I have my own group of disciples, my own center and community. I was thinking that I must be getting equal to other great masters. 
It was at that moment when I was in my glory that the donkey responded with a noise you heard, as if to say, here's what I think of that. At that point, my fantasies burned to ashes and I felt sorry for my moment of egotism. We all have our moments of ego and egotism, but they need to be extracted by the word of God. Because when the voice of the ego starts, it drowns out the voice of the spirit. May all of you be blessed as you gather with families today on this Father's Day. Be blessed by our God, Father, Parent, God who has created us and established us in his son, Jesus. Let's give thanks to this Father, from whom the fatherhood in heaven and earth receives its name. Be blessed, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's gather ourselves for this prayer that our world can be safe. We pray for safety in the pandemic. We pray for wisdom as people respond to this incursion into our lives. Dear God, I praise you for those that have gathered here today for the heartfelt prayers that they lift and we lift on behalf of the human family. We ask your powerful grace to give us that wisdom and that love that allows us to pierce through the darkness and get insight, wisdom, movement scientifically to understand and, and a vaccine this virus and help us, Lord, to respect the unknown in this virus, how it happened to be, how we've upset the planet in such a way that it unleashed this. We ask that you would just give us great humility as we join with all the other creatures of the world and respect and love them. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we begin to close, I'm gonna ask uh, Michelle Veith if she would give us this prayer and blessing for fathers today. Dear God, today we ask you to bless our fathers for the many times that reflect your love, strength, generosity, wisdom, and mercy shown to us, your children. We honor our fathers for putting our needs above their own confidence and comfort, for teaching us to show courage in times of trouble for challenging us to move beyond our comfort zones, for modeling the qualities that would turn us into responsible, principled, caring adults. We ask your blessings for those men who served as father figures in our lives when our bio biological fathers weren't able to do so. May the love and selflessness they shown us be returned to them and as blessings and help them to know that their influence has changed us for the better. We pray that those fathers who have passed into the next life be welcomed into your loving embrace and that our family will one day will one be will one day be reunited in our heavenly kingdom. We ask your generous blessings on all fathers today and every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear God, for this time of worship, for quickening within us that sense of your presence. We pray that that quickening would light a fire within us that will continue throughout this day of love and throughout all of the coming days of our lives. 
And we close now with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, art in heaven. Hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy, thy will, will be done. Amen. On earth as it is in Jesus. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not into temptation. And then deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.